Good morning. Welcome to Fountain of Life Baptist Church to our morning service. The Bible exhorts us to come into his presence, come before his presence with singing and into his courts with praise. And we're going to start with, we have come into his house, gathered in his name to worship him.
Amen. I hope that you've enjoyed worshiping the Lord together with us in song. This is the day that the Lord has made. 
We will rejoice and be glad in it. Hope that you're ready to meet with the Lord on this beautiful day uh, in which the Lord has made and he reigns over the whole universe. It's our privilege to know him and serve him and worship him. So let's bow together, ask for God's blessing on our time, and then we're going to worship the Lord in his word. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word today. Thank you for life and health and breath, our hearts beating, the blood coursing through our veins, uh, our lungs uh, doing their job and working to help us breathe, and, and we don't do any of it. It just automatically happens because of your grace, because of your goodness. Help us to use your goodness for good and to return uh, thanks to you. I pray that you'd bless our time now in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would take your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 10, we're progressing through the blessed part of King David's reign, the, this first section where we see him win battles, win victories, as well as in times of peace, do things to help people, be a blessing, to do things for God. And so this chapter starts out with a similar uh, scenario where David is sitting there and he wants to do good, but we see here that for the servants of God, for the people of God, it's not always smooth sailing. Things aren't always a bed of roses. In fact, uh, this situation is going to get a little hairy. Uh, I've entitled the message today, Fear the Beard, and we're going to see a, a, a hair-raising situation where uh, David and his men uh, mix it up with the Ammonites. So let's get into 2 Samuel chapter 10, and uh, starting in verse 1, I want to divide this chapter up into several sections, and first of all, I want to look at a kind gesture from King David. 2 Samuel 10 verse 1, it says this, And it came to pass... After this, that the king of the children of Ammon died, and Hanan his son reigned in his stead. Then said David, I will show kindness unto Hanan, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness unto me. And David sent to comfort him by the hand of his servants for his father. And David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon. By the way, who are the Ammonites? Do you remember them? They're often grouped together, the Moabites and the Ammonites, and they are the, the descendants of Lot. Remember when God sent the angels to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Lot fled. All the rest of his family end up dying. His wife turns into a pillar of salt, except for his two daughters. And he and his two daughters escape into the mountains, into the hills, and there the two daughters uh, hatch this plot. They say, we don't have husbands. We don't, we're not going to be able to have any children. So they get their father drunk. Lot commits incest with his two daughters. And lo and behold, we have from those two sons that are born, the Ammonites and the Moabites, who were long-term, who became long-term enemies of the children of Israel. They were not believers. They were not good. Now, God gave them a place. He, he said, I'm going to give them this land here just south of the nation of Israel uh, so that I, for Abraham's sake. Uh, and so we have these two groups of people. They were always enemies to the Israelites. Let's read a, uh, in Nehemiah chapter 13 a short account of how they came to be enemies. It says, on that day, they read in the book of Moses and the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever, because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass when they had heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. So the Ammonites and Moabites, this is when the nation of Israel has come out of Egypt and they're going across into the promised land. When they want to pass through that area, they say, hey, would you mind? We're, uh, we just want to pass through and we're thirsty. And they said, no, we're not going to give you anything you can't pass through. And then they hire Balaam, this false prophet that God uses to become a good prophet for one day, uh, to give a good prophecy that blesses the nation of Israel. 
but they wanted to destroy and curse the nation of Israel. And so God said, the Ammonites and the Moabites do not ever come into the congregation of the Lord and become um, part of Israel. Uh, and so uh, this is who the Ammonites were. We are not told what's referenced here. David said, this man, uh, Nahash, has been kind to me. We don't have that uh, recorded for us, but at some point, this man who was an Ammonite, who their people are traditionally enemies of Israel, but he just decided he was going to bless David. We don't know why. Was it because David was growing in power and he sees that God is with him and he doesn't want to be against him, so he's kind to him? We don't know why, but he was kind and now he's died. And David wants to be kind to his son, Hanan, because his father had been kind to him. It's always hard, by the way, to lose a parent. It's a very sorrowful time. It doesn't matter if it's uh, a sudden thing or if you see it coming and it's downward. Uh, you're never totally ready uh, if you love your parents. You're never totally ready for them to die. And so this was, uh, David assumes, a very difficult time for Hanan. And he says, I'm going to comfort him. I'm going to send uh, some of my servants just to say, you know, God bless you and to be kind to you. And so this was a kind gesture that David wanted to show. Leads us to our second uh, division, number two, an unprovoked humiliation. Something drastically opposite of what you would expect happens in the way that Hanan responds to this gesture of kindness. So 2 Samuel 10, let's go on in verse 3. It says, And the princes of the children of Ammon said unto Hanan their lord, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, that he hath sent comforters unto thee? Hath not David rather sent his servants unto thee to search the city and to spy it out and to overthrow it? So they're very suspicious. Uh, he starts listening to these counselors and they lead him astray. Verse 4, Wherefore, Hanan took David's servants and shaved off the one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks, and sent them away. When they told it unto David, he sent to meet them because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, Tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown and then return. So Hanan and his servants are suspicious of David's men, and so they capture them and they do them a great indignity. They shave off half their beards, they cut off half their clothes, their long garments cut off right to the middle, it says even to their buttocks, and they sent them away. And they're so ashamed that they don't even go home. They send word to David for what's happened. They don't wanna be seen out in public. Uh, in this disgraceful way. And David says, okay, you guys stay at Jericho until your beards grow back and then uh, come back home. So this was a great humiliation. We hear it today, it sounds kind of funny. We'd chuckle at it maybe. But this was a great humiliation to these men as they represented King David and as they represented the whole nation. This was a, an indignity not only done to these men, but as they represented David and the nation, this was a, a humiliating insult done to the whole nation. Uh, so, by the way, to mess with a man's beard back in these days was to mess with his manhood. Uh, and beards are found to be important throughout history for a variety of reasons. Sometimes people have done studies and, you know, they believe that prehistoric man, that uh, he would grow his beard uh, rich and full and thick to, uh, as a protection to help soften the blows of would-be attackers. Sometimes people look at beards as a way for men to attract uh, females, people of the opposite sex. Re researchers from the University of Queensland and the University of New South Wales in 2017, they conducted a study and they concluded that men with facial hair are found to be more attractive. Full beards seem particularly attractive for long-term relationships. Uh, and so that's, by the way, why my wife doesn't allow me to grow a beard because she's afraid that I'll just attract too many women. Uh, so uh, that was a joke, by the way. 
And uh, I'll let you decide which part was the joke, whether my wife doesn't want me to grow a beard or whether uh, I would attract too many women. Uh, I want to read what a couple of commentaries said about this moment, about this act of cutting off their beards and cutting off their clothes. Uh, Koch's commentary says, This was one of the most infamous punishments to be able to shave someone's beard as punishment. This was one of the most infamous punishments of cowardice in ancient Sparta that they who turned their backs in the day of battle were obliged to appear abroad with one half of their beard shaved and the other half unshaved. There were two reasons which caused the Easterns of old, as well as at present, to look upon the beard as venerable. In the first place, they considered it as a natural ornament designed to distinguish men from women, which by the way is uh, kind of frowned on to do anything to distinguish men from women. Uh, by the way, did you hear the, the latest um, edict from President Biden? He's, he's declared that facial hair is going to be banned because it discriminates against women that can't grow facial hair. And uh, it shows uh, the distinction in the sexes. We're not allowed to have that distinction anymore. Uh, that was another joke, by the way. He didn't ban it. But I could see our society trying to ban things like this that show masculinity and this toxic masculinity. So he goes on. Uh, he says there were two reasons that they would um, respect the beard. One, it distinguished men from women. Secondly, it was the mark of a free man in opposition to slaves. So that in every view, the insult of Hanan to the ambassadors of David was capital. It was a violation of the laws of hospitality and of the right of nations. So interesting, that would be one of the distinctions between the slaves and free people is that the free people in the East would grow their beards, slaves, as to show that they were slaves, they would make them shave their beards. Here's what Adam Clark says. Uh, the beard is held in high respect in the East. The possessor considers it his greatest ornament, often swears by it, and in matters of great importance, pledges it. Nothing can be more secure than a pledge of this kind. Its owner will redeem it at the hazard of his life. The beard was never cut off, but in mourning, not in the morning, that we usually shave in the morning, uh, when they would mourn uh, in a time of death or something, never cut off, but in mourning or as a sign of slavery. Cutting off half of the beard and the clothes rendered the men ridiculous and made them look like slaves. What was done to these men was an accumulation of insult. So it says that uh, some people would, uh, they used to swear by things. I swear by my mother's grave. Some people would say, I swear by my beard. Uh, just don't swear by your mother's beard. You know, that would be uh, a no-no to do. So it says that they shaved off half of their beards, I guess right down the middle. When I was young, when I was, I don't know how old I was, maybe eight or nine years old, I came upon all of a sudden one day my father's electric razor. And I was too young at that point to have any facial hair. I didn't have any anything to shave. The only facial hair I could find was my eyebrows. And so I proceeded to shave off uh, my eyebrow. I, I didn't shave off my eyebrows, just one eyebrow. It was uh, my attempt at a unibrow, apparently. And I looked pretty ridiculous for several weeks and um, was the laughing stock at school. I didn't shave off the second, I probably should have shaved off the second one just to be uniform, but I decided just to shave off half of my eyebrows. And so these men, they looked ridiculous for several weeks till their beards were fully grown again. And needless to say, this act of humiliation did not go over well. Uh, and so let's go on and see the response. Number three in our chapter back in 2 Samuel 10, an aggressive alliance that happens in conglomeration with this act of humiliation. 2 Samuel 10 verse 6, it says, And when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David, this is probably an understatement, he didn't like what they did. They stank before David. The children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Rehob and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 footmen, and of King Maacah, 1,000 men, and of Ishbab, 12,000 men. So, by the way, to this point, David hasn't done anything. He just, people get word. He didn't like it. 
He's very upset at how his men were treated. He wanted to show a gesture of kindness and it was rebuffed. And so David, they hear that he doesn't like it. And so they unprovoked, they hire, they, they start to army up. They hire this army and this army and that army and that army. They hire four separate armies, a total of 33,000 men, some of them uh, Syrians. And uh, they are apparently planning to attack. David doesn't know exactly what to think. They're not sending messages uh, about their intentions, but he can see their intentions. They're apparent. And, and when he hires these people, he's hiring them to fight against David. So uh, is Hanan, by the way, is he hiring them to uh, attack David preemptively, or is he hiring them in case David attacks him for protection? We don't know for sure, but it was definitely seen as a hostile act of aggression. And let's go on to number four uh, in verse seven, and we see an appropriate response. So David here, he is forced, his hand is forced to do something. He uh, his men were, this is basically kind of an act of war. This is something that could start a war, the way that these men were treated. And then all these armies are amassing uh, potentially to attack. And so David has to respond in kind. And let's start reading in verse 7. It says, And when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the host of the mighty men. And the children of Ammon came out and put the battle in array at the entering end of the gate. And the Syrians of Zobah and of Rehob and Ishtab and Maacah were by themselves in the field. When Joab saw that the front of the battle was against him before and behind, he chose of all the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. And the rest of the people he delivered into the hand of Abishai, his brother, that he might put them in array against the children of Ammon. And he said, if the Syrians be too strong for me, then thou shalt help me. But if the children of Ammon be too strong for thee, then I will come and help thee. What happens if they're both too strong? I don't know. We didn't think that far ahead. But look at verse 12. Be of good courage and let us play the men for our people and for the cities of our God and let the Lord do that which seemeth him good. So because of these two hostile acts, as we said, David's hand is forced to send out his army to defend his nation from this coalition of armies that's potentially going to come against them. And they had to fight this battle on two fronts. The Ammonites are coming from one side. The Syrians are coming from another. Joab notices this. And so he splits his army in two. He leads half of the army against the Syrians. And then the others... He, his brother Abishai is in charge of that division of the army, and they're going to fight against the Ammonites. Now, most of the time, whenever we see Joab in the Bible, he's usually very selfish, very self-serving. He's usually very conniving and even treacherous. And we will, in the days ahead, see more of his treachery. He's going to commit more murders. To this point, he's got one murder under his belt, the, the murder of Abner. Abner had killed his brother in self-defense, and so in cold-blooded revenge, he kills Abner. And usually, we see Joab wicked, but there are a couple of times where we see Joab offering good advice or even trusting in the Lord, which is what it seems to be here. Now, on the one hand, it would have been a scary thing, I think, to follow Joab into battle. Okay, we're going to battle, and Joab is our commanding officer. Well, what's about Joab? Joab is a murderer. He's got the judgment of God hanging on his head that could fall at any moment. Now, as it turns out, the way that God chose to do it, he waited until after David's death for Joab's judgment. David waited until after his death. He commands Solomon, his son, I want you to put, uh, punish Joab for his wickedness. But he's got God's judgment hanging over him. And to go into battle, in that state is kind of a scary thing. I have to say that I personally would be a little bit uneasy going uh, as part of the American military going into battle, knowing who we are as a nation, that we've turned our backs hard against God. Now, there's a remnant. There are churches, there are Christians, there are people who follow God, but there are so many, and our nation as a whole has turned away from God, and it'd be a scary thing to go into battle as 
the United States of America knowing that we can't have God's blessing on us. Listen to Joshua chapter 7 and verse 11. It says, Israel hath sinned, and they also have transgressed my covenant. This is when Achan stole from Jericho. And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also. And they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Wow. Uh, so Israel, by the way, I'm not saying that America is like Israel and that we're God's people. But the point is that whenever any nation, whenever any group of people turns against God or disobeys God, they've got God's curse on them. And it's a scary thing to go into that battle. You can't stand against your enemies. You can't be successful and victorious ultimately. Uh, so the saving grace here on this day was that the Ammonites were even more wicked than the Israelites. And to, on this day was... God's day to judge the Ammonites instead of God's day to judge Joab or, or the Israelites. So on this day, Joab has kind of an out-of-body experience and is actually trusting the Lord. This is rare for him. He's not usually one that, that looks to God. So he says, uh, we're gonna, we got all our armies together. You take them, I'll take them. We'll help if you need. He says, we're going to do our best. We're going to do our jobs. We're going to have our people fight for our, our people in the cities of our God. And he says, and the Lord do what seemeth him good. We're just going to do our best and we're going to leave the results. We're going to leave our lives. We're going to leave everything in God's hands. Whatever God decides to do that is right, we want that to happen. And so I believe this is an act of faith. On Joab's part. If he's not, if he's afraid, they just don't go fight. But he says, we're going to fight and we're going to trust in God to do right. And hopefully he has, you know, favor on us. Now, often in the Bible, when people use phrases like this, like the Lord do whatever seemeth him good, sometimes people use that that are guilty and they're just kind of hoping for the best, but they can't expect the blessing of God. Let me give you a couple of examples of this. Judges chapter 10 and verse 15, when Israel as a nation was in sin, it says, And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. You know, God, we don't deserve anything. We, you know, you do what's right, but if you would, please be merciful. Uh, deliver us, but don't give us what we deserve, but you do whatever seems good. Also, 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 18, when Eli had been a wicked high priest and his sons, he hadn't kept his sons in line, and then Samuel's got a message of judgment for him. He tells him what God says. Here's Eli's response, 1 Samuel 3, 18. And Samuel told him every wit and hid nothing from him. And he said, Eli said, it is the Lord, let him do what seemeth him good. Uh, so the fact that Joab says here on this day, uh, let's just do our best and the Lord do what seemeth good. Is, does he have some guilt hanging over his shoulder? Is he a little bit afraid that God may be judging him on this day? You know, God, I pray you'd help us, but you know, I deserve death here. Uh, you do whatever seems good. Uh, I, I kind of tend toward, let's just give Joab a pass on this day. And we'll say that he is walking by faith that he's trusting in the Lord, and he just leaves the results of the battle, leaves the results of this day in God's hands. This is the way, by the way, that we need to live our lives. Whenever we face a particular situation each day, we usually don't have a verse or a prophecy that we can turn to where God says, this is going to turn out in your favor. I'm going to do a miracle. I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to bless you. We don't know. The Bible says, we have no idea what a day may bring forth. Tomorrow could be the greatest day ever or the best day ever. We have no idea. If you have a terminal disease that's pronounced by a doctor, you have no idea. Now, God could do a miracle and heal you, or it may be his will to take your life in that way. Whenever you embark on a certain endeavor, an adventure, maybe it's a, a business venture, you have no idea. I have no idea how that particular venture will fare. Maybe it's gonna, maybe it's gonna fly. Maybe it's gonna flop like a lead balloon. 
And so we just do our best and we pray for wisdom, we pray for guidance, for God's blessing, but we need, we, we, like he says here, we need God's blessing at every turn. It doesn't matter how great the endeavor or how small. Oh, this is an easy one. I don't need to, to ask for God's help. No, it doesn't matter how small. With God, we can do everything, but without him, we can do nothing. We always need to keep that in mind. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Uh, God's blessing and favor is everything. And we need it. And, and so if we don't know how something's going to turn out, we just need to say, God, please bless it. You do what seems you, uh, you good. And I'm just going to be faithful and do my best. We should be seeking to live our lives always in obedience so that when we embark on this endeavor, we can pray the prayer of David, the psalmist, when he prays this. Psalm 26, 1, judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. May we be able to live our lives so that whenever we do something, we can say, God, I pray that you would bless us and bless me for my righteousness. Instead of having to pray, okay, God, oh, I've done this and this and this. I don't deserve, <laughs> I deserve real judgment here, but would you just break me off a little bit of mercy for this day? That's no way to live life. And so ultimately, we need to acknowledge God in every endeavor and know that we need his help if anything is ever going to be successful. And so this was the response that David and his army gave. And let's see, number five, a decisive victory. So they go, Joab's prayed uh, that God would bless or kind of given a declaration that God's going to do whatever he sees fit. And let's see how this battle turns out, starting in verse 13. And Joab drew nigh, and the people that were with him, unto the battle against the Syrians, and they fled, the Syrians fled before him. And when the children of Ammon saw that the Syrians were fled, then fled they also before Abishai, and entered into the city. So Joab returned from the children of Ammon and came to Jerusalem. And when the Syrians saw that they were smitten before Israel, they gathered themselves together, and hated and, and Hadarezer sent and brought out the Syrians that were beyond the river, so more Syrians. And they came to Helam, and Shobak, the captain of the host of Hadarezer, went before them. And when it was told David, he gathered all Israel together and passed over Jordan and came to Helam. And the Syrians set themselves in array against David and, and fought with him. And the Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew the men of 700 chariots of the Syrians and 40,000 footmen, horsemen, and smote Shobak, the captain of their host, who died there. And when all the kings that were servants to Hadarezer saw that they were smitten before Israel, they made peace with Israel and served them. So the Syrians feared to help the children of Ammon any more. So pretty one-sided, pretty lopsided. Joab and Abishai win their two battles, and then they regroup. They get more Syrians, and so David himself gets involved and brings more troops, and he slew, he, he slew so many of them. Uh, 700 chariots, the men of 700 chariots, and 40,000 horsemen. And so God gave David and Joab and Abishai and the men of Israel a great victory on this day. Um, it affected not just this day, but the future as well. It says the way the battle turned out, the Syrians decided, okay, Ammonites, if you guys ever ask for help again, forget it. We will not help you because um, we don't want to get on Israel's bad side anymore. And so God really magnified David and his kingdom and his armies on this day. So the moral of the story is obviously fear the beard, you know. Never touch, never mess with another man's beard or you call down the wrath upon you. No, obviously. Uh, but, but let me mention maybe a couple of the lessons here. One lesson of the story is to not automatically jump to conclusions about people and be suspicious of their motives, which is what uh, when David went to just be a blessing to, to Nahash, I'm sorry, to Hanan, uh, he assumed the worst. He jumped to conclusions. He listened to the wrong people. 
We need to be careful about judging people before we know all the story. Now, there are times that people can be deceptive. That obviously does happen. I mean, this scenario is what happened when the Babylonians came and Hezekiah showed them everything. Oh, this is great. Oh, it's wonderful. Oh, beautiful temple. Oh, we're coming back here to destroy that. Uh, there are times that people can can uh, pretend to be friends and then uh, can turn on you. But don't just assume this of people or else, you know, you can call down wrath by responding the wrong way. Another takeaway we see is that God protects his people here from the unprovoked advances of their enemies. But I want to finish with one more thought about this whole uh, scenario about the judgment of God. So the Ammonites here. They are much weaker than the Israel. If, you, if it's just Israel versus Ammon, there's no competition. So the Ammonites, they have to go and hire Syrians and hire other people. So if they are so much weaker than Israel, then why do they do what they do? Why would they do something so stupid as uh, needlessly poking the bear, you know, so to speak? Uh, David comes to bless them, and they just do something very provocative to him. You couldn't have drawn up a more unthinking and dumb thing to do as what they did. Why would they do such a thing? And I've kind of come to the conclusion here that this whole sequence of events was the judgment of God on the Ammonites for their wickedness, just in general, that God is going to bring judgment. And the way that he brought judgment was he had David go to be a blessing to them, had them respond in a negative way that would eventually cause war against them so that he could defeat them in battle and bring them down. I believe that's why this, what the sequence of events is. And we do see this many times in the Bible where God accomplishes his judgment through a circuitous path that you didn't expect. It's like, how did that get to that point? Uh, it was just the judgment of God. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 45 and verse 7. God says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Obviously, it doesn't mean here that God is evil. The word evil here means that God brings judgment and b bad circumstances on people. God says, I create that. Whenever someone does something wrong to someone and it's and it's bad and evil things happen god says i was in that in some way i was accomplishing now it doesn't mean that god is for wicked people doing things but but god uses wicked people often to accomplish, accomplish his purposes listen to joshua chapter 11 and verse 19 when the children of israel were coming into the promised land and conquering it says there was not a city that made peace with the children of israel save the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon. All other they took in battle, for it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly, and that they might have no favor, but that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. So many of these battles that Israel was fighting, they just show up in Canaan, and God brings the Canaanites against Israel so that Israel will fight against them. And that's the way that God brought judgment on the Canaanites. God reached over to the Canaanites and stirred up hatred or anger and brought them against Israel so that they could fall. Similar thing in Judges 14 and verse 3. This is the man Samson, who is a mighty, powerful judge. He ends up in Hebrews 11, the hall of faith. But he was characterized by selfishness. And sometimes he did God's will without even knowing it. Listen to Judges 14, verse 3. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord, that he, and that's the Lord, not Samson, that he sought an occasion against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Interesting scenario here. Here's what's happening. The Philistines are provoking Israel. They are having dominion over them. And God is saying, I am going to raise up. So by the way, that's why Samson's there, because God's raised up a judge to deliver them. 
And God says, I'm going to bring down the Philistines, and here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to have Samson, and by the way, God didn't want Samson to go and marry a Philistine woman, but he allowed it to happen to accomplish his purpose. So Samson sees a Philistine woman and says, hey, I want to marry a Philistine woman. He ends up marrying her. What ends up happening is that he gives a, a riddle at the wedding and uh, says, hey, if you guys can find out my riddle, then, then I will uh, give you a certain number of changes of garment. And so they, they come to his wife and they say, hey, tell us, this, tell us the answer to the riddle. And so she goes to Samson, what's the secret to the riddle? And Samson says, I haven't told my father or my mother. I'm going to tell you. But he ends up telling her. She tells the Philistines. The Philistines find out the riddle. And now Samson has to come up with garments. Uh, so what does he do? He goes and he kills a bunch of Philistines and takes their clothes and gives them to pay off his debt. And, and then there's another, you know, he goes on and he uh, burns up. The, they, then they burn his wife and father-in-law with fire. So then he burns up their fields and he goes back and forth. And it's like, wow, this is a convoluted series of events. And it was God judging the Philistines. And he used wickedness. It was wickedness for Samson to marry one of the Philistines. But God allowed it to stir up the judgment against the Philistines. So I believe that this whole scenario, that God led David to go to be a blessing to the Ammonites. And the Ammonites responded with a horrible provocation. And then they army up. And then God brings the judgment down on them. Uh, and I believe that God's hand is in this whole scenario, this whole series of events. And by the way, I will say this. I believe that much of what we see in our nation right now, look at all that's happened in our nation. And by the way, the pandemic's happened worldwide. But there's some things that have happened in our nation that haven't been worldwide. The, the anger, the hatred, the division on so many levels. I believe that God is allowing that as a judgment on our nation. We've turned our backs on him. And so God just raises up this person to fight against this. And one thing leads to another. Sometimes it seems like the, the demons are pulling the strings. Uh, but I believe that God is allowing all this to happen as judgment on our nation. And so a big takeaway is we need to walk with God all the time. We need his favor. We need his blessing because the judgment comes uh, in unexpected ways from unexpected places and people. And we need to make sure that we have God on our side. We need his favor. We need his blessing in our nation. We ought to pray. We need, to, we need revival in our nation. We need people to be saved. We need God's people that are saved to do their part and be righteous, to be light and salt in our world. We need God's blessing. Only God can turn around what's happening in our nation. And it's possible, but we need to turn to him. Proverbs 10, we'll finish with this verse. Proverbs 10, verse 9 says, He that walketh uprightly walketh surely, but he that perverteth his ways shall be known. The only way to have a sure thing of God's blessing in your life and in your nation is to walk uprightly. So we need to fall on our faces. The Ammonites, they were walking contrary to God. They were not God's people. They were wicked. And so God brought judgment on this day. And God will bring judgment on any nation that is wicked. So we need God's blessing. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to see your hand of power in, on behalf of Israel on this day. And there wasn't necessarily a miracle done, but it was your favor that gave Israel the victory as they trusted in you. And we know that you are for righteousness and you are against wickedness at all times and on every level. We may not always see the way it's going to happen, but it will come. So help us to flee to you. Help us to confess our sins on an individual level as well as on a national level as, as your people, as the church, that we would fall on our faces and repent. We need your blessing. We need your favor. Thank you that it's there for us if we will repent. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I hope that you go with God this week and walk with him and see his favor and blessing. God bless you. Thank you for watching today. If you have made a decision to follow God in some way or would like prayer, let us know at flbc at cox.net. We would love to connect with you, pray for you, or send you some resources that can help you in your walk with God. If you would like to know more about how to go to heaven, visit us at folbaptist.com slash heaven.
If you would like to give financially to support our ministry, you can do so at folbaptist.com give. Thank you, and God bless you.